get the ferret out of the box and let's get this going. All right. Ferret's out of the box. Let's do this, bitch. Biggity bam. Right. We're fucking back. You're late. <laughs> no Not late. I, a wizard arrives precisely when he intends. Well, I'm sure, I, I'm been... sure I, I, I am absolutely positive I fucked up that, that quote, but whatever. <laughs> Uh, I'm Christopher, and this is Jay, and this is the Grumpy Dungeon Masters, and I'm very interested in when you're going to start this episode, because I, I've been recording for like 24 minutes. Oh, I'm starting it the okay. second I logged on. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so, uh, I want to kick this off with something I saw, and I linked you. It was... I, the I watched it. I watched it like an hour ago, finally. Okay. So. The, seven, the, seven, the seven dumbest rules. I don't want to go over all seven, because that's that no, guy's I, video. That's his I, content. We can, I'm going over six of them. <laughs> okay. I just want to go over one. I, I, but yeah. And I, you know, I'm, I watch his fucking video. The guy's hilarious. He does a great job. What, what's the YouTube channel? I know you watch it all the time. Uh, the YouTube channel is... Well, crap. Hold on. <laughs> hold on. I, I probably uh, still it is up. it is a taking twenty YouTube channel. He's a DM that does a lot of path, Pathfinder and a lot of D and D and does a lot of videos. Um, and his most recent video on YouTube um, is the, the the dumbest rules um, in as fifth written as, as written. written. Um, it, I, I agree with him in almost all these cases. So, like, for an example, like, the faster you are, the more movement speed it takes to stand up because the rule in 5th edition is half your movement speed. Yep. So, you know, things like that that are dumb. But the one I want to talk about, the one that I saw was amazing, and this is my next character. All right. Kobold, the kobold? No, no. The lucky feet. Oh, well, that could be any character. That's not even a character, man. Right. That, it could be any the... character, but... You you tack on the the Hobbit racial as well too, oh, and it on, gets even on, more insane. On. But before you even fucking go into this, because I know several of my players listen. No, in this game, in my game, it does not work this way. Don't even fucking try this garbage. It is it is amazing, and you should allow it in your game. Never. But go ahead. Go do ahead. Do it, break, coward. Break, break. Do it, coward. Do it. Uh, if I do it, if I allow my players to do this bullshit, then every NPC they fucking run into has it too. <laughs> every so, NPC, even a goblin, you know, fucking like one quarter challenge rating goblin has this bullshit. So yeah, so the lucky feat reads. Uh, this is crop text from the ability. It reads as: Whenever you make an attack roll, you spend one luck point to roll an additional d20. You can choose to spend uh, one of your luck points after you roll the die, but before the outcome is determined. You choose which of the d20s is used for the attack roll. You can also spend one luck point when an attack roll is made against you. A roll in a d20, and then choose whether the attack uh, uses the, uh, the attacker's roll or yours. So essentially... It, it's that you it? choose which die to use. That's the key so, phrase. So the you choose... Which of the D20s is used for your attack roll? So you're you're a halfling. You run up to the dragon, and you go to stab it with your little dagger. If you just do that and you use lucky feet, you roll 2D20, and you choose which one to use. But if you close your eyes purposefully, making you essentially blind, so you have to roll at disadvantage, you give yourself an additional D20 to roll on that attack, letting you roll 3d20, and then you get to choose which result you want, overriding the rule for the you have to choose the lowest or disadvantage. And the funny part is, is that Jerry Crawford on the Sage of Ice stated that while that's not the intended rules as written, that's how he plays it in his game, so he suggests people to play it that way because he finds it better, which I find I, is amazing. <laughs> I don't think that's what he said. I, like, I... I... I saw what he had posted about it. He didn't say because that's better. Um, yeah, he, you know. he, he said that that is how it works, however. Right. Now, that being said, that's a stupid fucking rule. <laughs> I love and it, I will, though. And I absolutely will not use that, because if you're blind, the intention is that you're going to miss more often, uh, effectively counteracting your luckiness, because you're making it more difficult for yourself. But it's equated to like the the scene from um, 
Lord of the Rings, where uh, Sam or Frodo, I can't remember which one, stabs Shelob. Yeah. Just swinging you know, wildly. <laughs> swinging wildly, but not even looking, and just you happen to get that one spot in her, like, between, I don't know, thorax and whatever, right in, right in the jugular, yep. and you, t- you, take, you take out the Spider Queen. Like, that's what it's meant to be. Now, should you do it all the time? No. Maybe, maybe if the player was like, okay, I'm going to do this. This is our last attack we have on this guy forever. I'm going to close my eyes and just pray the gods give me a crit, you know? Maybe if you use it in that thematic kind of way, it would be interesting. But I I found that, while it's a dumb rule, I love it, and I want everybody to use it. For absolute thematic purposes, as you have described, I absolutely can see it. (laughs) I I mean, it does, you know, I get that. You know, D&D is storytelling. It's supposed to be very theatrical and thematic and so forth. But D&D is also a strategy game at the same time. So as a dungeon master, use this at your discretion. I personally will not be allowing it, but I can't say 100% that if my players end up in a situation where it would be fucking amazing, I can't say I wouldn't allow it once. Right, I mean, you only get three uses of Lucky a long rest, so it's not like you're doing this for every attack. Lucky is already pretty much the most broke-ass feat in the game. One of them, yeah. Even without this stupid rule. It's it's definitely one uh, of the uh, best feats out there. Uh. So, speaking of Dungeons & Dragons being a strategic game, um, it kind of brings up uh, what happened to me today. I actually went to my local game store and ran an actual legitimate D&D game for a bunch of people. Wait a minute, you... you... Saw people in person. Yeah, I saw people in person. You you ran D and D for realsies, not online. Right. I didn't even use D and D beyond. I ran it all pen and paper. Who I are did, you? I did. And what have you done with Chris? I did, however, uh, stay up till four a.m. after running my game from eight to midnight to get all the maps ready and place an order with Office Depot to get the maps printed out by the time the the game started. But Outside of that, I did actually run a real game at a real game store. Um, I was invited to go to my local game store, the Green Dragon, for the uh, Scarab game day that they have once a month. Scarab is a um, convention for board games and other nerdy-related stuff down in Columbia, South Carolina. It happens every January. I think on Martin Luther King weekend is when it happens. Okay. Um. Uh. And uh, so they're they're doing Scarab Game Day down here in Charleston, and I went out there and, and DM'd a game. Uh, one table was playing uh their continuing, I guess, uh, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden game. So that All was right. the above level one table. Uh, and I ran uh the Icewind Christmas Dale one shot. Christmas one shot Christmas no. one shot. I ran the I ran the Icewind Dale uh, Adventure League adventure, um, the first one of the series. So okay. DDAL ten dash one. I I ran it right from the book, all level ones, all new players. Uh, at the table, there was a guy in his twenties, a guy in his thirties, and then uh, four other kids between maybe thirteen and fifteen. Okay. Uh, none of them had played fifth edition before, but most of them already had characters made and had an idea of what they were doing and a general understanding of like, this is a D20 and I can roll it. And that's my attack. They, so had, rot- they had watched critical role. I'm assuming. I don't know. I didn't ask. Oh, okay. I'm not going to talk to kids. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> so we, we start playing the game and I'm, I'm doing this thing, which is kind of like a, the story is like they're traveling into Icewind Dale in a caravan and an avalanche hits them and then they got to survive the, the avalanche and the onslaught of cold and then fight the, the best owlbear ever created. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, my table of six players, I had, let's see, I had three, uh, well, no, sorry, I had four deaths. One player died twice. And oh, goodness. 
when it's so when it, the problem is when it came to strategy there was none and that was the problem with the table no one was like focusing firing or like you know there were six of them and there's like three wolves on the table they're all be like okay well i'm gonna sit here and i'm gonna devise a plan to like get this branch to bend over and call the wolf over so it gets stuck in my trap like okay i'll take you three turns to set up or oh, you can sorry. just shoot it with your yeah. short bow <laughs> and so we kind of had to like guide them to more like just 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 hit the, them. Yeah, you and, sort of utilize the best options available. Yeah, like I'm not going to stop you, but this may be a better option. And so like, <laughs> the, when it first happened, uh, the avalanche thing came out. The, the party itself survived fine, but they had to rescue some people that were still trapped. One guy's getting eaten by wolves. One guy's just stuck in a snowbank. The other guy's under a, under a wagon. All right. Party of six people, three people to save. All right. Divide four, people, four people decide to go after the, the warrior who's fighting off three wolves. Okay. And it takes them forever to do it. I'll get back to that. Uh, one person goes over to the guy that's unconscious, and two of them decide to build a fire and just sit down. Huh. Sorry, it's three people went over to the warrior. One went to the guy in the snowbank, and the other two decided to just build a bonfire and sit down. Never mind the guy trapped under the wagon. Yeah, fuck that guy. So eventually, <laughs> so eventually, the three people take out the the wolves around the warrior with the warrior getting hurt pretty badly by the wolves. Um, he was knocked prone at the end of it. Um, the guy in the snowbank, they were able to pull him out of the snowbank and like find his flask and stuff like that. One of the people from the bonfire eventually was making his way over there, um, but he was doing it very meanderingly. And then one went over to save the guy under the under the wagon. So, uh, the guy trying to save the guy under the wagon just didn't work at all. You needed multiple people over there to lift the wagon off the guy or pull the guy out from underneath. The, the kid was trying his best. Yeah. And he was lifting the wagon up with some amazing strength and athletic checks. But he just couldn't do it, and the guy died. One guy, you know. You yeah, one guy. More. Yeah. So, the guy that they... Pulled the snowbank, they found his flask, and they brought him over to the bonfire to warm up and not, you know, freeze to death. Right. The warrior. So when when the warrior, when they beat all the wolves, and the warrior is still prone, um, the combat had just ended, and the player to my immediate right, I called him right hand the entire night, he goes, I'm going to start taking off this man's armor. Of course he uh, does. Yeah. I was like, what? He's like, I'm just gonna start taking off his armor. I'm gonna steal it. I mean, he's alive and moving. He's like, yeah, I know. I'm like, all right, <laughs> you go. Like, you just walk up to a guy. And he goes, yeah, this armor's mine now. Yeah, you just just lay there. Just. Shh. And so I had the warrior try to hit him, and he missed. And the other two guys that were there try to calm the warrior down, and they did some good persuasion check and some role play to, to get him to calm down. And so the guy that stole his armor, the very next his turn just stabbed the warrior in the throat <laughs> just Wait, killed he, him out, right he stole his armor while he's wearing it he was trying to tried to okay okay yeah. i wanted to wanted to verify this all right yeah so he's trying to and then like i said he takes a swipe the warrior takes a swipe at the kid misses the other two people calm the warrior down and say just just don't take his armor help him up and then it gets bound on the kid's turret and the kid just stabs the guy in the throat and it kills him and, uh, then, and then the best part is, he doesn't even take the armor after that. He just walks away. <laughs> oh my god! Brand new players. Uh, they're they're the worst and the best thing about D and D. And I'm sitting here like, this really is not going the way the story said. <laughs> it does it ever? Does it ever when you have brand new players? Um. So the rest of the stuff went fine. Um. The encounters are encounters. They figure out the door puzzle with very little coaching. They did some good rolls and kind of try to figure it out. And they figured out the door puzzles. Um, and then the fight at the end is against this owlbear. And it doesn't use owlbear stats because they would just lose. So you're supposed to use a, a brown bear or a black bear, depending on how many people are there. Yeah, I was going to say, against level, level ones against an owlbear are just yeah. fucked. Um, I brought up my first edition owlbear miniature for this. Ooh. Ooh, yeah, fancy stuff. And this owlbear basically has been murdering and killing a lot of things. So there's a lot of, like, 
carcasses and like and entrails and blood all in its fur that have frozen over so its ac is actually a little bit higher that's an amazing way to get natural armor up a little bit frozen entrails on a body and it has like shard uh shardalian beak and shardalian claws oh, okay uh, and i use the black bear stats because there's six people here okay yeah so this out comes barreling through a tunnel um it's intelligent so it starts mocking them like, how dare you come into my castle? I'm going to eat you all. Blah, blah, blah. Six people. One guy is paralyzed because he looked into the uh, into a pit and saw horrors beyond his imagination and then he got paralyzed for ten minutes. Great. Um, and the other five. One started to engage with the owlbear. The other four decided to just, just stay on the other side and just see if the owlbear was really dangerous. Okay, I um, mean... <laughs> Yeah, you know, brand so, brand new adventurers, they might not know how it's going to react. So one one of the players goes, I'm gonna use my turn, I'm, I'm gonna try to like, hey, Albert, we're we're not here to fight you. We just we're just trying to find our way out. We'll do our best to just leave you alone. And he moved closer to the Albert to kind of like, you know, be friends with it. Yeah. But he also moved to the edge of a pit, and the whole encounter is built around the Albert pushing people into this pit. Oh no, really? It has legendary actions specifically to move to people and push them into the pit. The fuck? Who wrote this <laughs> module? <laughs> I don't know. First level legendary actions? What yeah. in the ever living hell? And so the owlbear goes running over uh, and goes, I, I, I really do think that I don't want to you know, have any harm to you guys. I think you guys should run out. The exit's right there. Push. <laughs> yep. I just... Goodbye. <laughs> this and is Sparta. The pit. And the pit is filled with hundreds upon hundreds of undead bees. bees. Hands. Definitely bees. No, oh, no undead crawl, hands. Crawling claws? No, just undead hands. That's a crawling claw. That's what that is. N- no. This is this is like an AoE trap thing. Oh, okay. For every, for every round you start or turn in this like pit, you just take 2d6 damage from the, the, the claws beating on you. Okay. It's it, like the in the in the in the story. It's like a sacrificial pit where these people were cutting off their arms. The Nethers yeah. are cutting off their their hands and throwing it in the pit, and animating them. If crawling so, claws could be a pit trap, there it is. Right, and so he level one two d six on the start of his turn. Yeah, you yeah. If you're at full hit points, you got maybe two rounds to get out right. if you're, if, if rolls go your way. And the thing is that they say that this this is very this is a Albert that was awakened by the awaken spell, um, so it's intelligent and it knows to go after the healers first. So the next person. How does against... that even work? How does that fucking work? And Albert is a, a, what are they aberrations? They're not animal. It's a monstrosity. Yeah, uh, yeah but the awaken spell only works on beasts. Well, that's what the book said. I, I I agree. You know, I, you, I, I, you play it I was the way having, the book says. Yeah, I was having fun with this too, <laughs> and so it runs over to the other healer and goes, "Hey, do you like the pit?" <laughs> She's like, "No." <laughs> Push. <laughs> oh my god. <sighs> I, honestly, was... I I kind of I want to meet whoever created this module and both thank them for it and punch them for it. <laughs> um. I, like it's it's so good it's so bad that it's good. I love this. Go ahead, continue. So yeah, after I have both the healers in the pits, um, the Albert just kind of runs around and systematically destroys the rest of the party because it's using the Black Bear stat, so it gets a claw and a bite, swinging two d six plus four and one d eight plus four. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. gonna drop people and mo- it's gonna drop most people in one swing or two at the most. Right. So it, it's kind of just tearing them apart. The healers die because they're stuck in a pit with claws. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, they can't get out. They didn't even get a chance to crawl out. I think one guy had one round, and his round was he tries to throw his rope up out of the pit and got like a 16 on his um, slide of hand to throw the rope up there. But there's like no one there. So like the rope just slid back uh-huh. down. Like, what are you going to do? <laughs> So did the whole party die, or uh, I know you said so, you had four four deaths. So six people. So the, the guy that I called right hand, he died again in that fight, and he had died earlier in the story as well too. Yeah. And Al ate him. And Al ate him. Al ate him with and his Al beak. Al ate him. Al ate him with the beak. Um, 
So he died. Both the again, both the healers died. And what happened was is the most amazing string of death save twenties I've ever seen. Like another rogue gets knocked down. His next turn, death save twenty. He's up. He gets Gotta another get round point. against the owlbear. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And then like the fighter goes down. His first death save. Here's another twenty. One. <laughs> He gets around against the owlbear. Playing the fucking one one body game without a healer. Right. And then it happened like two more times, I think, throughout Shit. the entire night. Like it was amazing. I've never seen that many happen. Um uh, but yeah, it was, it was actually the twenty got the fighter up and the fighter was able to do the last blow to the uh owlbear beast. Wow. And they actually killed it. So the three were able to make their way into ten towns. Yeah. And that's what it takes to get into ten towns. I, I complain when players aren't going to let the, the bad guy monologue like it, it, you know, it's written to monologue. There's story to tell and all. But I absolutely understand why, because sometimes if you don't act, you get pushed into a pit by an owlbear. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was great. Um, we had to skip like one puzzle because we just were running out of time. Um, but overall, it was it's a great little module. It was, it was the first official one for the uh, um, D and D, uh, or sorry, the the Adventures League for Front Rhyme the Frost Maiden. The thing is, too, is part of the notes said that if someone plays this module, they are level two at the end of it. Right. Um, but if, however, you play the module during September 2020 when they released Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, you got a level per hour played as a bonus. Holy shit! So. The group, I think this was written for the group being level three to fight the owlbear at the end. Not level one. <laughs> that seems more likely, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they still killed it. They just lost some people. And I actually told all the kids ahead of time, I was like, listen, I'm not here to kill you. I'm not here to win. I'm here to help tell a story and have you have you guys have fun. I was like, I will roll all my rolls in front of you so you can see everything that I do. Um you know, so you know that I'm not trying to, you know, or get you know, or anything. Yeah, it's I'm people saying, you it's like, don't know, and you know, right. nobody has that. You don't have that trust level between everybody. So, and I was like, you have to understand though that you are level one fifth edition, which is like the worst level to be, as most things will kill you in a hit, maybe two. <laughs> and like a wolf here swings, what what two d six plus three or some shit. Plus one. Yeah, so, so, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. It, it's it's enough that within a round or two they yeah. can kill you. So I was like, so don't worry if you keep dropping a lot. Just focus, strategize. You guys will be okay. And that is the one thing they didn't do. They didn't strategize at all. It just scattered like lemmings in all directions and <laughs> try to figure things out. <laughs> and uh, they they pulled through the skin of their teeth a few times. And like I said, they were able to. Uh, Beat the Albert at the end of the day, so uh, they had fun. They they yeah. liked it. They all, I had if, them all going ah oh, the entire time. So if they keep playing, they'll, they'll figure it out. Everybody figures it out how to sort of work as a team after a while. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I'm glad you got to run that. I know. I mean, hell, it's been way too long. Uh, I, I will actually be back in person with my regular group in two weeks. Yeah, for, for D and D. It was physically exhausting. When I came home, I was just beat. Like, yeah. having to socialize for five hours is rough. But you also said you stayed up till 4 a.m. <laughs> that too. <laughs> Which means you didn't have nearly enough sleep, of course. No, definitely not. All right. So that was uh, my fun little story and just what I've seen in D&D &D this week. All right. Now, Time I'm, for I'm, your I'm, segment. Beat that. I'm, yeah, I'm, well, I'm just going to backtrack to your segment. God, you can't do that. Oh, I, I absolutely can. We can talk about those other uh, stupid ass rules that make no sense, yet they are actual rules. All right, and fine. You we get, don't you have to go over them. all of them, but there's a, there's a few of them I absolutely want to talk about. One is the the kobold one. So, oh yeah, where where you get they have pack tactics, so you do a um a yeah, ritual that no one are familiar. I don't have yeah I don't I don't have it here in front of me but basically the the idea is that kobolds due to an ability they have as a playable race get advantage on all attacks if there is a uh, person on your side within five feet of an enemy an ally within five yeah it's it's packed yeah an ally. yeah okay 
So with pack tactics, the idea is you pick up ritual caster as a feat. That was the one that was suggested. And summon yourself a familiar. Then you just keep a weasel or whatever the hell your familiar is in a pouch on you. And then at all times, if you're in melee, you then have advantage because the weasel counts because it's a familiar. Yeah. The only difference between that and just picking up ritual caster as a feat and getting a familiar and just having the familiar be flanking is that it's just because they have pack daggers, they can keep it on them at all times. Right. So like you can do fine familiar. You can do our, uh, the, you can get a familiar. Uh, I think there's an example where a guy has a floating pig. All right. And the pig, he just always just has his familiar get behind the target. So he has flanking. If the familiar gets hit and dies, he just make another familiar. Yeah. You know? So he still gets advantage that way. It's just a little bit harder to pull that off. But not too hard, especially if you pick something like a spider and have the spider go into the room first and then crawl up the back of the big bad guy and just stay on the back of the big bad guy. It's Technically, it's flanking. Technically. Technically. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, there's, there's other ways around that. Just the cobalt of the pack tactics and you can keep it on you just makes it kind of just that one step above being what stupid. The, what the fuck do you even get for a familiar in fifth edition? Whatever you want, really. No, do they they give you anything? Do you get any bonuses for having a familiar? You have a familiar. Is that it in 5th edition? Like, nothing whatsoever? I will look it up, but I'm pretty sure you just just get a familiar. You get, like, a cat or... Yeah, Yeah, I I honestly, I should know this, because I played a fucking sorcerer with a familiar for a long time, and it's, it's just been a while. I don't recall. I know earlier editions... Familiars mattered a lot. If you had, you can one. cast, you can cast spells through it. That's right. That's about the only benefit to having a familiar. But there's no drawbacks to having one. No, uh, no. In third edition, depending on what type of familiar you got, you actually got bonuses. So if you had a cat, you got advantage on you know like a perception checks or some shit like that. If you had a bat, it might be you know advantage on perception checks for hearing. Things of that nature. And I don't recall exactly what 2nd Edition gave you, but it absolutely gave you bonuses in 2nd Edition for having a familiar. That being said, also in 1st and 2nd Edition, if the familiar died, you had to make a system shock check, and if you failed the constitution save or whatever the fuck it was, you died, just straight up died when your yeah. familiar dies. But That's you actually bad. got you, but you got a lot of benefits for having them. In 5th Edition, it's like, there's no drawback but there's no benefit so yeah it just seems like a waste to me they should do more of that any others you wanted to to mention yeah yeah i absolutely have more stuff i wanted to talk about the grung falling damage this one fucking is hilarious to me and yeah (laughs) i'm I'm just gonna say if, if anyone ever plays a grung it works this way so for anyone who's not familiar grung are they're frog people and it is a monstrous playable race. And one of the abilities they have, don't have it here in front of me again, but they have the ability to leap straight up in the air 15 feet. Yep. Doesn't doesn't say shit about landing. Nope. <laughs> it says nothing about landing. And the rule is if you fall more than 10 feet, you take a die six of damage for every 10 feet, you know, 10 feet of distance you fall. So if you jump 15 feet in the air, bam, you take a D6 of damage. Like, I love this. Yeah, play a grung. See what happens. So technically, you can just jump up and fall to your yes. <laughs> fall to your death. Yeah. It's yeah, ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's a stupid fucking rule, but I actually, I just think it's so funny. Well, the same thing with the magic. I don't like boots leaping and shit like that. You, you can leap 30 feet straight in the air. Yeah. Well, yeah. if you're not leaping onto something, you're just going to fall back down 30 feet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, uh, mind you, boots of leaping are, I, I think most people primarily use them for distance jumping, but yeah, you know, if you jump straight up, well, it'll take some falling damage. <laughs> now, I also sort of, I, I sort of have house rules on falling damage. Like, I will usually allow people an acrobatics roll or some shit, and I think this is a carryover from like earlier editions. But I allow a acrobatics roll to half the amount of damage they take. Just something I've always done. 
Then it should only work until you reach terminal velocity. Yeah, I mean, there would be limitations to it. If you fall like you know, 300 feet, well, I'm not, I probably am not going to allow that. But if you're just falling 30 feet, all right, I might. So here, here's actually something that's kind of kind of funny, is that if if you're a barbarian and uh, you, you have a, the total, I think it's just anything. So you just, you, you're falling an incredible distance. As long as you enrage before you hit the ground, you still you take half damage. Uh huh. So <laughs> that, that's always yep. there, barbarian. Yeah, just get really pissed before you hit the ground. That's all that matters. And honestly, with his, the ground. with yeah. as many hit points as barbarians have at you know at moderate levels, you could hit terminal velocity and not die from it. I think maximum falling damage in the game is uh, twenty d six or some shit like that. Something like that, yeah. So honestly, a, high, a decent level barbarian who doesn't rage would probably still just live. <laughs> there was a uh, a trap in uh, Tomb of Annihilation that was a bunch of gears, and the guys get stuck in the gears and get crushed. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a barbarian that got stuck in it, and he was getting crushed to death. <laughs> and I, I told him the damage, and I said magical bludgeoning damage. Uh, because that's what the book said, magical bludgeoning right. damage. And he's like, oh, I can resist that. It's like, no, no, you can't. It's it's magical <laughs> bludgeoning damage. But it's bludgeoning. It's, but it's bludgeoning. I was like, no. All right, how much did I take again? 160? <laughs> I mean, I would have agreed with him. You know, it's, it's bludgeoning, even though it is magic. There's nothing in Barbarians that say you can't resist magic bludgeoning. It's... Yeah, he can't resist magic. He died. Oh, well. <laughs> he um, got ground up. So, another, uh, I'm going to talk, there's two more of them I wanted to quickly ish talk about because sure, actually, it's like what, all five? No, there's a few of them that are just fucking rules that are whatever. I don't care. But there are, there's three more of them here that are so goddamn funny to me that I have to go over them. The, the, the fact that caltrops can stop oozes from moving. Yeah, that one was weird. That's just weird. So not every ooze moves the same way, but some oozes have a movement speed of 10 feet. And the way caltrops work is if something steps on them and fails the dexterity save, they take one point of damage and their speed is reduced by 10 feet and they cannot move until they heal one point. Because that's they don't how get the movement are... back, yeah. Yeah, they get no movement back until cal- you know, until they're healed. So effectively, if it fails the deck save, an ooze just can't ever move again. Which is, I, I, I will tell you this now, that's not how it works in my game. That's a stupid fucking rule, but it's really funny. Heresy. Yep. Well, I, I'm, I get to house rule my own shit, so get used to it. Heresy. This is something, yeah, this is stuff that never comes up and never would have if we had talked about it on our podcast <laughs> mm-hmm. all right what's the other one uh the, specifically i want to talk about the centaur one why are centaurs in fifth edition only six to seven feet tall because they wanted all the create all the playable races to be medium uh, yeah that's just dumb and the fact that centaurs can now ride horses is even dumber I gotta, I'll put a horse on your horse so you have more horse in your horse. Double because horsepower. It, yeah, if you're medium-sized, you can ride a horse. That That's in the rules. <laughs> Doesn't matter that you already have four legs. It, it, it's, it's, like, it's like season seven of, uh, or part seven of uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure where like the lead guy can't walk, so he's just always on a horse and it has a horse stand. That's That's all it is. Uh, well, I, if I play as a centaur at any point, I'm going to buy a horse. I'm going to name it Butt Stallion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to play, I'm going to play a centaur named Jack. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that's all the rules you wanted to discuss. Uh, sure. Why not? There was a couple others, but I, I don't really care too much about them. Devil, St- Devil Sight one was kind of weird. Uh, where you can one. see you can see farther in darkness than you can in candlelight. Oh yeah, because candlelight yeah. makes dim vision. Yep. Yep. 
Yeah, fifth yeah. edition with the dim vision and dark vision just really didn't work. Um, I kind of just hand wave it to be it's either bright or it's dark because in fourth edition, like Drow had dark vision, mm -hmm. Doors had dim vision. They could see in dim light. Dim like, vision is that what they fucking called it? I think so. Maybe they called it something else, but they essentially had dim vision, so they could see in low light condition or low light vision. So uh -huh. they could see in low light conditions, but they couldn't see in pitch black. Okay, yeah. Whereas so that, drow, it, yeah, third edition, it was black. third edition. It was low light and dark vision. Yeah. So I prefer that. I just not gonna hand wave all the races to have low light and dark vision. You know. Yeah. So it is what it is. Yep. I mean, fifth edition, it's simplified. If you can see in the darkness, you can see in the darkness. I, mm -hmm. I just think it's really weird of how it works with candlelight. So I, I yeah. it, the way I generally handle that stuff is the same way I've always handled it. If you have dark vision and you are standing in candlelight, you can't see out of the candlelight. You know, even if your shit says you can see 120 feet, if you step out of that candlelight, your dark vision kicks in. You can see the extra 120 feet, but that kind of light sort of turns off your night vision. All, you know, yeah. It's always worked that way. Yeah, it, it's real hard to manage that online. So I kind of uh -huh. just basically said, "Hey, here's your all's sight that you can see. That's bright light if you have dark vision, essentially. And here's the dim part that you have. So if you're shooting into a dim part of the screen, it's going to be harder to hit that versus you know something that's you know in complete darkness versus something that's actually you know within your normal light radius. Yeah, yeah, I forgot and, you. Were I forgot you actually use a proper line of sight. What do they call yeah. it on on there? Just line of sight. Okay. Well, yeah, but I mean, I you could your players can see what they can see and nothing else. Yeah. Oh, yeah. With fog of war. Yeah. 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 Basically. <clears throat> All right. Oh, so I'm jumping into the middle of this podcast to do the uh, the commercial stuff. We do it normally at the end. Because I noticed that when people listen to the podcast, they don't listen to this part of the podcast where we plug all our stuff. So, really, we're in the middle, really? we're putting we're, in the we're... middle. Yep, we're putting in the middle now from now on. Uh, so, ha -ha. No. no, this is a terrible plan. So, make sure to follow us on Twitter at Grumpy Dungeon Masters. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Grumpy Dungeon Masters. We're on Twitch uh, every uh, Tuesdays and Fridays playing video games, and we do our D and D stream on Saturdays at twitch.tv forward slash Grumpy Dungeon Masters. You can also find us on Instagram and on TikTok at Grumpy Dungeon Masters, but we don't post there, so good luck. We just we just have it. Someone takes the handle. I just want everyone to know that I don't agree with anything said. All right, now it's time for your segment. I, I just did a segment. You did half a segment. Do a real segment. Let's talk about hags. Why do you hate hags? What's wrong with you? Because hags suck. Hags are great. They're way better than Durger or Dwerger or whatever those stupid dwarves are called. They got they got a shared spell pool. And they're all wisdom saves. It's just it, if if your characters can can pass wisdom saves, you beat the hags. Ooh, hard fight. Lightning bolt does not give a fuck about a wisdom save. Well, they don't use. They don't start off with lightning bolt. If you have a coven, they do. You start off with whole person or no. eye bite. Or some other yeah, shit. Yeah. Well, there's there's if they have a if they have a coven, there's one casting of eye bite, which is a very powerful spell to start with. You hit the fighters with it because fuck your wisdom saves. And yeah. th and every turn you hit another melee fighter with, or melee person with it, except maybe not the paladins. <laughs> but it's still a save or nothing spell. Yeah. Well, that's one yeah. hag that's doing it. The other two throw lightning bolts or phantasmal killers at your ass. Right, but still, they only get three lightning bolts, and if they use lightning bolts and they use up, yeah, I think uses the whole person. Spell. No, it uses up counter, counter, spells. counter spell. Right, and then they do other things, and they lose the other stuff. But it just you can burn through their spells so fast, and it just they're not. I guess if you're RPing with them, then they may be more interesting. But for, for roleplay purposes, night hags, I think, just hags in general, I think are one of my absolute favorites for roleplaying purposes. Yeah. Because they do make great villains. 
and, and just mm-hmm. sort of bad guys. Because a hag doesn't really want to go toe-to-toe with people. They would much rather make deals, bargains, barter, and fuck with people. You know, and then they also have the, the sense of if you... I know this happened in one of the campaigns you ran where your players mess with a hag and then she would constantly fuck with them while they're sleeping. Yeah, that was in Tomb of Annihilation. Yeah, the nightmare haunting thing that they do. They just go hang out on the ethereal plane and then never let you get a proper night's rest. Right. Which... In in this in this case that we had the last stream on Saturday. Yeah, which the... we can't talk a whole lot about, but let's let's right. just say there's a coven somewhere around. Yeah, there's a coven somewhere around. And there's just the fighter versus the coven. All right. And I threw every spell they had at him. And he just rune night moonwalk his way through that coven, killing one of them in the process. They finally got him down with just uses of magic missile and, and a good lightning bolt. But he resisted like all but one whole person, uh, the eye bite, the polymorphs, <laughs> the bestow curse. He just, he yeah. just wisdom saved his way out of all that shit. See what you do? You you obviously start with the eye bite, and then you go phantasmal killer, phantasmal killer, phantasmal killer, and if he's still standing after that, then maybe hold persons. But so, like, phantasmal killer is a nasty fucking spell, man. Yeah, but it, it just it just puts on the frightened condition, and does a lot of psychic damage at the end of the day. Yeah, but they're you know it's every round they have to make another save. They're taking damage the whole fucking time, and the other hags can be hitting him. Yeah. So, but like I said, he just rune night moonwalked his way through every single wisdom save. He last level he did hit nine, and I think when he hit eight, or yeah, when he hit eight and got his next feet, he picked up resilient. For wisdom so he yeah, was I mean, just that's smart yeah, it's smart and he basically just took out two of them and then the other people showed up to help him out and they basically fought one hag at a time because i had them tried i had one hag doing the nightmare haunting on him and i kind of figured that's more of an active thing they do to him for an hour yeah. so she was kind of busy doing that to him um like trying to just kill him and take his soul sort of thing so it was just one hag versus the, the other three that showed up. And she came close to killing them. I will say that. A yeah. couple, one good lightning bolt, and then a bunch of magic missiles, essentially, because they were out of spells. And like I said, I didn't roleplay them because it was just a single guy. They were like, oh, just one person just walked in here? Uh, yeah, um, whole person. All right, let's stab them. <laughs> so... Yeah, that's see, I, I, I just, I went. mean, that's, that's how you ran it. I definitely, I didn't run it remotely that way. I role-played the shit out of it, and my players ended up acquiescing to the hags, even though they probably could have taken that coven without, <laughs> I won't say without, you know, a fight, but they, they would have won in almost all situations. Uh, yeah. Secondly, I think if there had been a fight, the hags would have just fucking jetted and you know, done the uh, nightmare haunting bullshit to them. Well, could, I I didn't think they could yet because they were already on the ethereal plane. Um, uh, it doesn't say. I don't think it said where they're they could at. Use, they could use plane shift to get out, but yeah, yeah, they had methods of getting out. Yeah, but either way, hags are are absolutely just one of my favorite enemies because of the role play aspects of them. Are they the most powerful? No. Yeah, but. At the same time as DM, you can rewrite them to do kind of what you want. You don't like the spell list that uh, the Coven has? Fuck it. Give them different ones. You know, make them a whole bunch of evokers instead. <laughs> you like just dropping fireballs? Well, fuck it. They all get fireball. Gonna have a hat Coven full of fucking battle masters and champions and rune knights just What's show up. What's to say you door, can't? Doorstep. Uh, I... Like, yo, you like storm runes? I got storm runes. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing that says you can't do that. While hags are primarily, you know, magic focused in general, it's your world, man. Your world, you can do what you want. One of the things that always freaked me the fuck out in third edition, there was a prestige class, uh, like you could play monster races in third edition, 
and it was possible to play a Mind Flayer. One of the mm-hmm. prestige classes you could take as a Mind Flayer was a Mind Flayer who had given up psionics. But in the process, yeah. he had like metal sheaths over his tentacles, and you could whoop people's asses with those. Okay. I That's mean, pretty cool. yeah, like it's just so off the wall and weird and not even remotely Mind Flayer esque, but you became a battle version, like a, you know, a fucking fighter version of mind flares so what's to say that you couldn't have something like that for hags hags already hit reasonably hard they've got really good high strength anyway yeah yeah be hags that won like the arnold uh, strong woman contest <laughs> fuck yeah <laughs> you even lift bro i thought you how lifted much, <laughs> how much you bench <laughs> <laughs> how much do you bench Critical hit. Mm-hmm. Shows up, just starts flexing all roided out and shit. <laughs> just wearing a fucking Speedo. <laughs> oh. All right. <laughs> oh, I have a comment that I needed to bring up to you from okay. the honorary Grumpy Dungeon Master, Bruce. Oh, what, what does Bruce have to say? What have I done now? Aside from not answering his last two phone calls. Um. Uh, did you do how to handle online encounters? Um, so I I don't remember the exact conversation. Uh, it was it's been a while. Uh, you brought up in your little spell segment. Um, uh, like the giant control Earth spell. Um, uh, yeah, the uh mud, the rock to mud version, yeah. shit like that. Yeah. Um. He said you stole his idea because his idea was to do that with like the control water spell and essentially melt the ice underneath the players to get them stuck in a giant ice cube and kill them that way. I don't remember me and him ever talking about that uh, as a well, DM. He told me that I that he told me that you stole his idea, but he only he told it to me. I didn't tell it to you. OK, that makes no sense. <laughs> you're, you're guilty by association. OK, that's that's how this works. All right. By the way, listen to the Drunken Drunk with Buds podcast. Yeah, have check a cool them out. New guest this week. It's a good podcast. Listen to it. Um, and so, then we got wait, the- so he wanted to control water to freeze people. So yeah, you could control water. You could basically just you know, you I don't know if you could really change ice, but essentially you make you unharden a forty foot cube of of water, you know, from ice to water. And the group will just fall into that water. And then next round, you just make it ice again. You know, I, 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 I'm I, not... Oh my god, there's a lot to the spell. I'm not going to sit here and read this thing at the moment. I'm just going to agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> I think control water really is just... You, it has to be water already. I don't think you can make it ice, but like you could have it like... You can have water like go into an object, leave an object, make a whirlpool... One of my players actually used it during Round of the Frost Meeting to stop a ship from sinking. You know, the ship yeah, was just battered in, yep. there were holes, and he pushed all the water out with control water. You just, yeah, you send it to the Underdark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we'll, that got us... We'll go down this route again. <laughs> that got us talking to um, uh, using Tsunami on the Underdark, like we talked yeah, about on a yeah, podcast, yeah. like, four. Um, he says that if you do that, you get experience for all the monsters that you kill in the Underdark that way. Yeah. And I say you don't. Just because um, you cast a spell into something and indirectly kill a million XP's worth of, of monsters, you don't get a million XP. You get creative, but... And then he said that, well, I play Fat Pathfinder, and the way Pathfinder works is, is if you do something and get XP, it only applies to that level. It won't carry over to the next level or some something. I don't know. Play, I don't play Pathfinder, so like no. you'd only gain a level out of that. Uh, but I'd say yeah. But in D and D, you would, from the way you're saying, you would get a million experience points because you just drowned the Underdark out. So just to, yeah, I I'm trying to think about this. That's it's almost like secondary damage. So just as an example, assuming you could do this, high level wizard or whatever, you summon up a Balrog, and mm-hmm. you drop a Balrog in the middle of the Shire and it murders mm-hmm. every halfling within six miles. You know, you just give it the command, kill everything except for me. 
So it runs around yeah. for an hour, murders every single living thing. Would you get the experience for that or would you not? I would not give you the experience for it. Because you didn't do a goddamn thing except cast one spell and then sit down, smoke a cigar, and have a cup of tea. Now, if you were on the back of the Balrog, riding him like a majestic mount, commanding him to, to kill things left and right and, and otherwise, and actively hey, that participated... <laughs> Stop yeah. on him! Stop on his head! Um, then, yes, you would get experience. But if you just if you just cast him on the Shire... And I was like, cool, then sat down in your sun chair, pulled out your mirror, and got your coconut drink, and just started sipping on it for the next hour. No, you don't get shit. <laughs> yeah, you know, I actually, I kind of agree with your reasoning on this one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, I, I would say if you are pretending to be, <laughs> to be Master Blaster with, <laughs> with a Balrog, okay, I'd give you XP, but if you're just sitting in a lawn chair, not happening. Right. You'll get experience for casting the spell. You got 10 experience for casting the spell. <laughs> Summoning a Balrog. Good job. Way to go. <laughs> you did damn great. Yeah, damn it, Gandalf. And then he brought up um, handling random encounters. <laughs> um, he like he said that uh, he likes to use a hex grid and do the and pulls a hackmaster style where like if you're in the mountain region, here's your mountain table that you could randomly encounter mountain encounters oh, and yeah, mountain yeah. hex yeah. grid. And I'm like, that, that's really cool, and I really liked it a lot. That's actually what I did in 4th edition. I had a bunch of, you know, the Nintier Veil all hex gridded out, and I had my players move from one to another. It took X amount of food to move so many hex, hex grids. Sure, yeah, yeah. That's, it's a very simple way to yeah. do it. Now, that has nothing to do with random encounters. Literally, well, a, you know, random encounters, there's fucking charts for it in Xanathar, so depending right. on where, where you're at, what area. I've just got tons and tons of level-based... Yeah. And that's, that. that's just the, how he handles random encounters on his, the, yeah. the Hackmaster style. I'm and, okay with know, random encounters. I just felt that they don't add anything to the game in most cases. He agreed with us that having a scenario for every random encounter worked. Yeah, and that was a lot more. And that was the end of the honorary Grumpy Dungeon Master Bruce Burkhart's comments from our previous podcasts. Well, thank so, you, Bruce. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Now, that yeah. being said, I... Icewind Dale, the last bits of it where we're at, the random encounters are actually really good there. Uh, I mm -hmm. haven't, I've been following the, the method for having them, and it's it's been very few that I've managed to roll so far, but they have actually been somewhat interesting because it fits the narrative. It fits the place, uh, what's going on there. Yeah. As it, opposed yeah. to just walking through the woods and, oh, it's a bunch of goblins. The last chapter of Icewind Dale is really, really good. It, better than any other chapter. Probably the best chapter so far that I've ran out of any 5th edition campaign book. Yeah, I really like it. because It's, it's just a little different and just a little... It's 5% off normal, and it's great. Yeah, like I would honestly, I would consider coming back at some point and just running that last chapter. Yeah. Just start start the characters at a reasonable level, brand new characters or whatever, and you know, you just run it and it'll take probably three or four game sessions. If they really want to dive into it and you want to add more stuff, you could probably get several months out of it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's really cool. All right. All right. I, let's move I, on to your spell segment. No, I don't have one this week. I wasn't planning on it. You didn't want me to do it last week, so fuck it. I don't want to do it every week. All right, the spell this week is Magic Missile. Let's talk about it. Yeah, well, Magic Missile, it's a classic, man. It's the best fucking spell in the game, besides yeah, Fireball. Yeah, Fireball. No, I, I, I'm an absolute fan of Magic Missile. So, the last wizard I was playing, he was an evoker. And, you know, he, he fireball, 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 fireball. But I did manage to come across throughout the course of the campaign a couple of wands of magic missile. And I found the best way to do that is just to unload every single fucking charge in that wand mm -hmm. when I need to. So at that point, you're hitting them with like nine missiles or some shit. Yeah. That's pretty reasonable fucking damage for a first level spell. And the wands are so cheap because it's just a magic missile wand. 
Yep. I mean, Shelly likes hers. She picked up one. Yeah. You're just using it all day. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, they're real nice. Uh, so, as for the spell itself, yeah, a little less useful, but it's nice because it never misses. It's guaranteed damage. Yep. And if you if you have a whole bunch of little guys who are really hurt, you can just finish off this guy, finish off that guy, finish off that guy. The the worst part about Magic Missile is on D&D &D Beyond, it doesn't have a button to roll for it. It's really weird. Like You have to roll the 3d4 manually and then add 3 for the first level, and then you have to keep track of what you're doing <laughs> for the higher levels. It's really weird. Um, I much prefer Jim's Magic Missile. Yeah. Now, have you seen that spell? I have, but go ahead and refresh my memory. So, when 4th edition started, Chris Perkins and the guys from Penny Arcade started uh, their own little D&D &D podcast and called it Acquisitions Incorporated. Yep. And it was so popular uh, that they ran it at PAX East and West a number of times. Became such a hit that they, they kept running it and doing it and having more podcasts and more shows. They have... Uh, a stream that do uh, two acquisition corporate streams, I think going on right now. And they even released a campaign book and f officially for D and D to add in acquisition incorporated to, to the game. If you're looking to run a business in a fifth edition setting, that's the book to pick up because that's essentially how, what the book is all about. It's very jokey and got a lot of comedy to it, but the, the, the parts about how to run a business or run a corporation and all the stuff add just specifically about that is found in no other book. It's just that book. So if you're looking for that kind of flair or spin to your game where you want to run an adventure party that wants to incorporate stuff, that's the book to do. That's, that's the book to read. Um, so they have a bunch of joke spells, and one of the joke spells is Jim Dark Magic's Magic Missile. So it reads as the following. Any apprentice wizard can cast a boring old magic missile. Sure, it always strikes the targets. Yawn. Do away with the drudgery of your grandfather's magic with this improved version of the spell used as used by Jim Dark Magic. So it still throws the same three blasts, and you, every high level you cast another blast, but you make a range attack for each missile. All right. Okay. If the missile hits... It does 2d4 force damage to the target. Okay. All right. If the attack roll is a critical hit, the target takes 5d4 damage instead all of right. rolling twice. Okay. If the attack roll for any missile is a 1, all missiles miss their target, and they blow up in your face, dealing 1 damage per <laughs> missile to you. Ouch. Okay, yeah, that makes that a horrible spell. It is an amazing spell. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I miss I miss Greater Magic Missile from 3rd Edition. I want them to bring that back. There was actually a Prestige class in 3rd Edition that was specifically devoted to using Magic Missile. And I don't remember it at this point. I'm going to have to go dig this up. Maybe for next podcast I'll talk about it if I can remember. Uh, but yeah, like the whole the whole idea behind the wizard was you just cast magic missiles you do it very very well you get like bonus damage and you know, other shit to go with it i think there was something like that for fourth edition too which just like amped up magic missile through the roof hmm. people love the spell yeah. always have yeah it's it's a good spell it's, it's a good go-to i like i like jim's magic missile Next time I play a wizard, that's all i'm gonna get it's just i mean I, magic I, I like the idea of jim's magic missile just the fact that if you roll a single one, though, it, it just all goes to hell and basically a spell well, fails. It's, it's all remaining ones. So, like, you do an attack and then it hits, an attack and it hits, and then it fails. Oh, well, that one blows up and so does the remaining ones. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it it's... I I, th I think the risk far outweighs the benefit. It does, and, yeah. And then you, then you can have gun holsters on either side of your wizard where you pull them yeah. up and you're actually firing them out of your wand, like they're pistols. Just don't be like me when I played the sorcerer and I cast magic missile because you can shape kind of what your spells look like. They all looked like him shooting the bird. They were just hands shaped like a bird. We had a we had a guy named Vanache Panda raid our channel as Shelly was dumping her entire wand of magic missiles into a target. Okay. So I said that all the magic missiles got fired off for little tiny pandas. 
fly, flying through the air. <laughs> and that's a thing now. All of it all is. of Shelly's, yep. All the magic missiles are nothing except pandas. Yep. <sighs> all right, I think that's enough for this week. Thank are you, you sure? guys for listening. Yeah, I think so. I think we're done. All right, time for the new outro. We have a new outro. Yeah, you pitch everything. What? I'm just going to. I'm just going to add the old outro. <sighs> Lazy. <laughs> Bye, guys. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the podcast. Check us out on Facebook at. There's no at in Facebook. It's just facebook.com forward slash grumpy dungeon masters. And on Twitter. Uh, that'd be at grumpy underscore DMs. And on Instagram. At grumpy dungeon masters. And also be sure to follow us on Twitch. Twitch.tv forward slash grumpy dungeon masters where we play Rhyme of the Frost Maiden every Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Fuck yeah.